Dear all, thank you for joining us again. Uh, it's like good morning, you know, and uh, and welcome to the One World Heritage Twenty Our World Heritage Twenty Twenty One debates and the month dedicated to the impact of disaster and pandemics on World Heritage sites. I am Umberto Bonomo, director of the Cultural Heritage Center at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. And with uh, Fernando Perez, Karen Gole, Yolanda Muñoz, and Hilter Gonzalez, uh, we plan uh, this uh, very uh, satisfying seminar, One World Seminar, that brings us profound knowledge and uh, accumulated from uh, around the world on how pandemics and natural disaster have affected and continue affecting our world heritage sites. The speakers of this session will kindly share different case studies, experiences, and lessons, allowing us to obtain a better context related to the recent, recent situation and state of our world heritage. Throughout this month, uh, we have organized more than 20 sessions and conversation, a collective effort of more than 100 people, some of which are from the most remote areas of the globe. I would like uh, also to thank to all the coordinator uh, of each session and the presenters who will accompany us throughout this uh, month. For those who uh, not know the uh, our World Heritage Foundation, it seemed relevant to me to recall our goals. The purpose of the foundation is to promote heritage protection, conservation and management, uh, to support knowledge-paid decision-making, to promote good governance of the World Heritage Convention and to engage, uh, maybe the most important, uh, to engage and empower civil society in heritage protection and management. Having said this, I will introduce the theme of uh, this month, sharing with, uh, sharing with you a short video that explains uh, how disaster and pandemics have affected the world that we live. Hilter, please. I do it for you. One Is second, it? please. Uh, I can do it, don't worry. Okay. Recent disasters and an actual pandemic have exposed the fragility and vulnerability of our world heritage. These exceptional sites and pieces, which we would like to preserve for all humanity and future generations, do not exist in a segregated world. They belong to our social environment and our daily life. But at the same time, the world heritage sites are in danger. They are threatened by natural hazards that attempt against their existence. The pandemic has revealed their fragility and how much the human presence in them is vital and necessary for their survival. How can we protect them and at the same time give them life and new meanings? If we hope for a future for them, we should stop considering them only as beautiful objects or places, merchandise for the tourist industry, and fully integrate them into the social and cultural dynamics of daily life. We propose to promote a great discussion around the world on the risks and effects of disasters and pandemics on world heritage sites. We invite non-governmental organizations, academies, representatives of civil society and local governments to participate, to contribute with new proposals for public policies on the conservation and safeguarding of the cultural and natural heritage of humanity.
Okay. <clears throat> and now I will uh, present the session, the today's session. Then having said this, I will introduce the theme of this month. Uh, please silent Hilton. Silence the, the yeah. Uh, I will introduce the theme of this month, sharing with you. Uh, well, yeah, I said that. Today's session is a prevention and conservation in world heritage sites, with the, which is moderated by Marcela Hurtado, a president of ICOMOS Chile, architect, a specialist in conservation and restoration, PhD in history of hard uh, and Ibero-American uh, architecture, professor at the Department of Architecture in La Universidad Técnico Federica Santa Maria, and director of the Master in Sustainable Architecture Rehabilitation, member of the International Scientific Committee on the Analysis and Restoration of Structures of Architectural Heritage. Marcela, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Umberto. Good morning, good evening, and good night to everyone. Welcome to the today's session focused on pre prevention and conservation in World Heritage Sites. First of all, special thanks to our speaker who will present cases from different regions of the world. Thanks also to Catholic University for inviting me to coordinate the, this session. Thank you, Umberto, Karen, and Yolanda. Let me start making a short presentation about the topic of today. In recent times, the vulnerability of cultural heritage because of both natural and man-made threats has been demonstrated. The consequence of the loss of cultural heritage in all expressions has a strong impact on the history and tradition of people and communities affecting their normal social, economic, and environment development. In this scenario, it is essential to install and strengthen capacities for disaster risk management among all stakeholders to reduce vulnerability to potential threats. In this sense, investing in prevention through programs, regulation, or projects should be a priority task to contribute to preservation of heritage and to promote sustain, sustainable development of the communities. We're going to start today with a, a Takeyi Okubo. He's a professor at the Graduate School at the College of Science and Engineer of Rizumeikan University in, Tokyo, in Kyoto, Japan. He is also director of the Institute of Disaster Mitigation for Urban Cultural Heritage at the same university. He's member of ICOMOS iCorp since 2004. He, he is also board of the member of ICOMOS Japan since 2019, a member and member of the board of ICOMOS International since 2020. His background in civil engineering, architecture, and global environment engineering he informs his current research interest, urban and architectural design for disaster mitigation of historic cities, which promote the ut utilization of traditional knowledge for disaster mitigation of heritage will, with wood and flammable materials. His recent work includes the management of the UNESCO Church International Training Course on Disaster Risk Management for Cultural Heritage and Historic Cities, with, which has been held every year since 2006. He also teaches as a UNESCO Chair Professor since 2019. Welcome, Professor Kubor. He's going to present protecting historic areas of wooden buildings from the fire due to earthquake using natural water resources in Kiyomisu area. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Marcia. So very nice to see you. So this is Takeuki Okubo. And uh, today I would like to explain about, uh, uh, so may I share the screen? Okay. Uh, was it OK? Perfect. Okay, okay thank you. So uh, today I would like to explain about uh, uh, fire disaster prevention in case of historic city uh, of Kyoto. So you know, uh, Kyoto and Japan is uh, a very uh, famous as uh, uh, so much uh, disaster 
uh, situations. And especially in the case of historic cities, so most of the uh, buildings are built by wood and paper. Uh, so as that uh, we should uh, think about how to uh, survive the uh, earthquake and uh, post earthquake fire. And in, in, this is a background of Kyoto. So uh, we have uh, so many uh, historic uh, cultural heritage, uh, including the uh, World Cultural Heritage Site. A uh, number is uh, 15. And the population is uh, also uh, very uh, high. Uh, with uh, so elder people, uh, the city is also very old, uh, but uh, uh, living pe people, uh, the uh, most of the people are elder persons, and also the, we have uh, so many uh, visitors uh, uh, from uh, uh, Japan and also the abroad, and uh, uh, the night uh, time. Um, uh, number of the people is all, almost 1.5 million, but uh, the number of the tourists is more than 50 million per year. And also we face the risk of earthquake every day. And uh, you know, the uh, earthquake is uh, occurred uh, periodically. And basically in this area, so we have uh, uh, 100 or 150 years, uh, a big earthquake uh, occurred. But uh, the last earthquake is uh, already occurred in uh, 1830. So at that, the time limit is over. Uh, in the scene of the uh, disaster situations, uh, most of the uh, narrow street, historical narrow street, uh, will be blocked because of the debris. And also the, uh, for the uh, firefighting, uh, we need a much amount of firefighting water, but uh, because of the uh, cut off of the uh, water, fresh water network, maybe so it is. It can be very difficult, and especially in the scene of the uh, earthquake fire. So we have uh, so much uh, multiple simultaneous outbreaks in a short times. So as that the situation is drastically changed uh, from the uh, daily basis. So as that now we understand it is not possible to rely entirely on governmental or official uh, support in disaster. So as that, uh, we should think about uh, how to uh, control the fire with the local uh, peoples and also the existing water resources in the area. And this shows the uh, location of the uh, historic district. And today I would like to uh, discuss about the site nearby the Kiyomizudera World Cultural Heritage uh, Center. And this is the photos. Uh, you can see the very traditional and beautiful scenery, but uh, because of the slope uh, uh, structure, uh, so as that uh, uh, even in the daily basis, uh, it is very difficult to go inside uh, by the uh, emergency services. And most of the buildings are built by wood. And uh, every building is uh, stand by uh, side by side, uh, so as that if fire started, so it can be easy to uh, spread. And this is the important tower of wooden pagoda named Yasaka. And also so we have very uh, narrow street and, and like a maze. But uh, this is a very important uh, cultural value uh, in the same time. So as that we should think about and how to uh, promote the safe environment with uh, those uh, cultural and uh, historical values in the same times. And this is a site for the project uh, started from 2006. We uh, developed the uh, water uh, distribution systems uh, other than the freshwater network. So, you know, in the scene of the earthquake, uh, we should uh, keep the backup systems uh, for future. And the first project is started at the center of this uh, Kiyomi's World Cultural Heritage uh, areas. And uh, so at first, uh, we should uh, develop the uh, water resources uh, for the first step. So as that, uh, we built uh, 1,500 uh, cubic meters rainwater systems uh, in the underground of the uh, center of this area. And this is a cut image of uh, distribution and the utilization of uh, water. So we try to uh, connect the uh, hydrants for systems uh, for uh, quick fire controls. 
you know, in the scene of the uh, serious disaster, maybe the professional firefighters sometimes cannot reach at the site. And so as that, uh, we need to support the local people's activities uh, at first. And this is an example of the uh, uh, citizen's hydrant. Uh, we should uh, think about how to design uh, those equipment uh, to harmonize uh, with the historic uh, environment. And we design those uh, fire uh, fighting equipment, not only for emergency situations, but also for the daily basis. Uh, you can see the uh, photographs using uh, this uh, fire equipment for uh, water uh, spraying uh, to stabilize the uh, dust in the road. So, so as that uh, they can use it uh, without any uh, fire uh, prevention drills from daily basis. And we uh, try to uh, modify these systems more easy to use uh, for daily uses. I'm sorry, it's uh, Japanese. <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, we try to build a uh, backup about the uh, reservoir uh, on the uh, higher uh, elevations. You know, on the uh, ground, uh, we need a pumping system to pressurize the water. Uh, but in the sea of the emergency situations, sometimes uh, such kind of the uh, engine and uh, damage, get damaged. So as that, uh, we try to build a, another uh, backup uh, systems on the uh, upper side of elevations. At last, uh, we very fortunately uh, find a site in the uh, Kiyomi's World Heritage Areas. And so as that, uh, we can use the uh, water, uh, not only the uh, pumping system, but also the uh, gravity pressurized uh, systems. And this is a summary of the firefighting phase. So the first stage is uh, uh, civic uh, activities. So the local people try to uh, extinguish the uh, fire uh, with a uh, uh, citizen's hydrant. And the second stage, it needs a professional uh, firefighters uh, who can use a, a professional existing uh, hydrant and so on. But in the scene of the uh, spreading uh, fire situations, it is very difficult to control uh, the uh, fire because of the um, uh, much uh, high temperature uh, and also the narrow street. So, uh, we try to develop the, a special nozzle to spray the little amount of water uh, to the uh, surface of the wooden uh, facade of the narrow street. So, you know, so if the water can uh, spray uh, on the uh, surface, uh, it can con control the temperature within 100 degrees. And so as that, uh, we uh, try to uh, make the uh, experiment uh, to uh, how much water is needed for control in the uh, surface within 100 degrees. And uh, now uh, we de uh, already developed this special nozzles uh, for uh, Miyoshinji temples. And uh, uh, this is a future plan uh, to uh, distribute this uh, water sealed systems on the narrow street to divide the uh, site into the small blocks of uh, possible uh, fire spread. And this is uh, uh, a test case uh, to uh, save the cultural heritage uh, from the spreading fire. So we try to uh, set this kind of the nozzles uh, surrounding the uh, important heritage sites uh, to control the uh, radiant heat uh, by the water spray. And uh, this is a, a completed plan of water supply systems. And of course, for future, uh, we need to uh, expand uh, this uh, system towards the whole of the uh, possible uh, spreading areas. Uh, but uh, because of the um, uh, fund limitation, uh, it, it, it is a long uh, way to uh, reach to the goal. And at this time, I uh, explain about the uh, water uh, distribution systems using the uh, natural rainwater but uh, it needs uh, much uh, money and time. But in case of most of the uh, historic city, we have the, so many water resources in the site. And so as that we should think about how to utilize and uh, uh, regenerate the, uh, the capacity of existing water for uh, fire control. 
Thank you for your attention. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation, Professor Okubo. Now is the turn for Peter Phillips. Uh, Peter Phillips is conservation architect management, uh, his own company since 1982. His lecture on conservation and heritage in the Faculty of Design, Architecture and Building at the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, he has held different positions in ECOMOS as Secretary General and Vice President. He's member of ECOMOS Delegation to World Heritage Committee since 2015 and is an expert member of the International Scientific Committee on the Analyze and Restoration of Structures of Architectural Heritage since 2008. He's president of ECOMOS Australia between 2005 and 2008, and Treasure between 2003 and 2005. Uh, he's going to present the conservation management in troubled times, the Sydney Opera House. Welcome, Peter, and you have the floor. Can you, share, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect, Peter. Okay, thank you. Right, um, uh, welcome to everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. I want to begin, as we do in Australia, by acknowledging the uh, First Nations people uh, both of my country and of all the countries in which we are present. Um, I myself am uh, on land which is uh, uh, the traditional owners, are the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and the Opera House is also part of uh, land uh, of the um, Aora Nation. I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to uh, the elders, past and present and emerging, and also acknowledge uh, their care for the land. And uh, uh, because as they have taught us, if we care for country, it will care for us. I particularly want to acknowledge a past leader of the Aora Nation, whose, uh, whose name is Walarawara um, uh, Bangalong. And uh, he's, his name has been anglicized as Benalong, and this piece of land which you see in front of you is where um, a, a hut was built for Benelong shortly after um, the uh, European colonizers arrived. The place itself was known as Tubagule, which is uh, translated as where the knowledge waters meet. So fast forward 150 years and Sydney, now a thriving city, decides that it wants an opera house. And this is where they decide to put it on this point, which is now called Benelong Point. Fast forward another 50 years and the Sydney Opera House is inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2007 as a masterpiece of human creativity. And it's called an extraordinary interpretation and response to the setting in Sydney Harbour. These are some of the quotes from the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value, a daring and visionary experiment that has had an enduring influence on the emerging architecture of the late 20th century. And it represents multiple strands of creativity, both in architectural form and structural design. This is um, uh, the, these two illustrations. The first one is one of Utzon's early sketches. Uh, the second one, obviously, his developed sketch for the original proposal for the shells, which was um, uh, as a, a thin shell structure. And after a great deal of work by Utzon and over Arup, the structural engineer, um, to demonstrate that the thin shell structure was um, impossible at the time, Utzon came up with the rib structure using this analogy of the um, uh, pieces cut out of the same sphere and rearranged to form what we now see as the shells of the opera house. 
um, a remarkable piece of architectural thinking. So now one of the key aspects of the Sydney Opera House is its setting, and it's mentioned in the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value. The map you see on the left there is the, uh, in red is the site itself. Uh, this is the, the, map, the World Heritage Map. And the area um, hatched is the buffer zone. And you can see that the majority of that buffer zone is water. It's, it's the water of Sydney Harbour. And here you see the Opera House on Benelong Point sitting surrounded by water. So obviously it's, it, and the response of the uh, designers to the harbour setting was one of the key aspects which won them the competition uh, and of course also one of the aspects of its outstanding universal value. But as you can see, the Opera House is vulnerable to sea level rise. The map on the right, which I hope you can, you can see, is, um, okay. is an indication of the rate of sea level rise around Australia measured during satellite altimetry from 1993 to 2019. And the darker the colour, the more the sea level has risen in each decade. Um, if you know your map of Australia, you will see that this dark uh, part here is actually where Sydney is. So the Sydney Harbour is rising faster than the rest of the ocean around Australia. The lower concourse of the Opera House, which is um, behind the seawall here, is at the moment about 0.6 metres above mean sea level. Um, the loading dock, which is underneath the forecourt, and the car park, which is behind it underneath the, the cliff, uh, all below sea level. The predicted sea level rise by the end of the century is at least three quarters of a metre. So um, you can see that there's a, a vulnerability here. So we're not talking about a disaster that's happened at this stage. We're talking about one that appears likely to happen and that needs a response. Um, at this stage, um, there, there is, is uh, um, you know, although it's, people are aware of that, there's no uh, considered response to, to that, uh, um, that potential disaster. The other thing about the Opera House is it's the purpose for which it was built. And this is not actually mentioned in the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value, except in passing. But clearly it is a fundamental aspect of the significance of this place, particularly um, when you look at national significance uh, and state significance. Um, and this, this is not uncommon in world heritage, that the things that matter to the people where the place is are very often not quite the same as the reasons for which they, they are celebrated and inscribed on the list. So this is, um, you know, a, an absolutely typical uh, full house performance in the Sydney Opera House Concert Hall. I have to say also that the Concert Hall is undergoing some uh, changes at the moment, uh, which uh, will hopefully uh, make the acoustics even better. But what if nobody can perform or come to a performance in the Opera House, which is exactly what happened last year? COVID-19 closed the Opera House completely from March to November. So the whole purpose for which this place existed um, couldn't, could, not, could not happen. Now, clearly, the, um, it had a huge effect on the, on the uh, companies that uh, used the Opera House. Um, the effect on tourism was essentially the same as for any World Heritage site. But because this is a performance venue, um, the effect is even more marked. Some of those companies could develop an online presence, and certainly the Opera House did its best to um, uh, produce an online presence. They had a program called From Our House to Your House, uh, which was intended to, to try and do that, but the place itself was empty. So how do you conserve places like this? There is an extremely detailed conservation management plan. This is in fact, the fourth edition of the conservation management plan. Um, and it's a, uh, an extraordinarily complicated document. 
What it does, apart from the usual um, conservation planning uh, aspects of uh, assessing what the significance of the place is and developing um, policies for conserving that, that significance, it actually breaks down the whole of the place into its different elements. Each of those elements is then uh, broken down further into its components. And for each of those components, um, the attributes are examined. So, for example, the, the attributes can uh, consist of the form of the of the component, the material of which it's made, um, and, and its location. And all of those are given a rating which relates to their tolerance for change. And the tolerance for change is obviously directly related to the significance of the component and the whole element. Um, the more significant uh, the element is, the lower the tolerance for change. But in some cases, the uh, material could be changed um, without affecting the significance greatly. In, in a very few cases, the location might be changed. Um, so uh, it, it's actually a really good way of, uh, of looking at the place and guiding um, how, how it can uh, change in the future. And the ar original architect, Utsun, acknowledged that the place did have to change and develop over its lifetime because um, these places are not static and particularly the, its primary perform, uh, uh, purpose is performance and the needs of performance are changing all the time. Associated with that is a risk management policy. And this, I, I think, is possibly the first risk management policy that, in my experience, that actually puts heritage in as one of the issues that need to be managed un, under risk. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, all of these, the different um, uh, risks are assessed um, according to their significance and, and the usual risk management processes apply, the likelihood of the event, the, the duration of the event, its impact, um, whether it's significant or not, and so on. The interesting thing, though, is that the current risk management policy really doesn't look at long-term cumulative things such as sea level rise or um, extraordinary events like pandemics. And um, so perhaps a future edition of the risk management policy will need to look at those things. Um, that's it. I'm happy to take questions when we come to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very interesting presentation about a wonderful building. And now uh, let's move to Africa. Welcome to Khalid Eraboni. He is a PhD by University of Portsmouth Computational Mechanics in Wessex Institute of Technology in the United Kingdom and State Engineer Diploma Civil Engineer by Mohammadia School of Engineering, Mohammed, University Mohammed V in Rabat, Morocco. Is a full professor of civil engineer and, compu and computational mechanics, deputy director of research and uh, the Ecole Nationale d'Architecture, Rabat, Morocco, responsible of doctoral studies, centers, architecture, and related discipline of the same Ecole, and scientific coordinator of the research team sustainability in architecture and urbanism. He's expert scientific evaluator appointed by the National Center for Scientific and Traditional Research in Morocco since October 2019. He's also expert member and vice president of ISCARASA and vice president of ICOMOS Morocco. He has more than 30 years rich research and professional experience in civil engineer, urban planning, building energy efficient, advanced computational technique and heritage architecture. Uh, the presentation is Prevention and Conservation Management of Cultural Heritage in Fez Medina, Morocco, a World Heritage Site. Welcome, and you have the floor, Khalid. Thank you very much, uh, Marcello. We will... Uh, Excuse me. Uh, 
I am uh, looking for my uh, presentation. Can you see my uh, presentation? Uh, yes, Kali. Yes. Okay. Thank you again, Marcella. I would like uh, to thank and to congratulate uh, uh, the organizers for uh, this uh, event, uh, especially uh, our colleague from the and uh, as you said, my uh, presentation uh, is uh, about the prevention and uh, conservation management of the cultural heritage in Fez Medina as a world heritage uh, site. Uh, Medina of Fez was founded in the ninth century and uh, it reached its high in the uh, 14th century and the Marinids and again in the 70th uh, century. Of course, uh, Medina Offense is among of uh, Moroccan Medina's network. And as you can uh, see here, is located in the center of uh, the of, uh, Morocco. Uh, we have uh, more than 30 Medinas in, in the in the all of, uh, of the, the country. Uh, because uh, we are talking uh, about the disaster and the pandemics, uh, let me say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, all the pandemics uh, that uh, affected uh, uh, Morocco uh, include, uh, of course, uh, smallpox, uh, typhus, uh, plague, cholera, and uh, of course, uh, currently COVID-19. Uh, and all these uh, epidemics uh, have affected uh, Morocco from the 15th century, uh, because we have some information, of course, on, uh, on these, uh, on these uh, uh, epidemics. And uh, we can say that uh, uh, we had uh, the Maghreb plague of the 15th, 16th, uh, focusing, of course, on, uh, on, on Fez Medina, uh, uh, especially the, the Mellah, Mellah uh, the, the Jewish quarter uh, in the, the Medina. Uh, and and uh, other other uh, of course other uh, uh, epidemics. Uh, there is also another problem. Uh, of course, uh, all the historical uh, buildings and monuments and Islamic heritage architecture are located uh, uh, in active seismic zone. And uh, in Fez Medina also was affected by some violent seismic. And we can see here the frequency of earthquakes which uh, struck the town of Fez. A lot of uh, violent uh, earthquakes. Uh, according to the uh, regular uh, uh, parasismic of uh, the, the country. Uh, as you see, uh, of course, uh, uh, Medina of Fez is located in, we can say, uh, middle, middle, middle uh, uh, seismic zone. Uh, if we compare it with the other zones, for example, here in red color, we have the, the, the high uh, seismicity. So, Fez as a world heritage city in 1981 is the spirit, spiritual, scientific, and cultural capital of uh, Morocco. 
A few years ago, Fez Medina offered a striking contrast between areas of thriving economic activity and over densified residential quarters whose buildings have been deteriorated steadily. We have, of course, uh, a cultural heritage and monumental of an exceptional richness, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, historical buildings, uh, residential buildings, mosques, uh, medersas, uh, caravansaries, and so, and so on. <clears throat> But we have also some degraded historical built environments. And the Medina is today a major economic center for the whole urban uh, uh, agglomerate of, uh, of Fez. And its economic sectors are art, it is not cheap, and, and, uh, and uh, tourism. Uh, let me again give you some uh, figures. Donc, uh, we said that the foundation date was in 9th century. The area, uh, 300 hectares, and uh, very high density, and uh, more than 14,000 of historic buildings, including uh, residential and uh, monuments, uh, and uh, of course, other uh, building. Uh, we have also a large number of historic monuments, 3,000. And of course, we have also one of the oldest universities in the Islamic world, the Al Qarawiyin. We can say that uh, Al Qarawiyin University Mosque was in uh, 857 and marked the start of the city's golden age. The Fez Medina uh, was subjected and still subject to an extensive rehabilitation program, uh, aims, uh, which started in the year 1981 to, to today, and runs over 35 years. Uh, the safeguard program aims at restoring and uh, preserving the economic, cultural value, and social heritage of old city. And uh, this uh, safeguard process, uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, decline it uh, in uh, some uh, uh, principal stage. The first one uh, started from 18. So uh, he, during this uh, stage or this period, uh, we had the launching of the safeguard process of phase and the second stage deepening and experimentation. And the third one, collaboration with the international financial institutions and lotting of the grid structuring program. And we can also uh, show all this stage uh, and uh, of course, uh, with the objectives, approach and tools used during each stage. And of course, uh, all uh, stakeholders or actors uh, involved in, uh, in, in, each, uh, in the process. The second one, so I will uh, go through uh, all this. Uh, and the third one. And the fourth, 2000, from 2005 to 2013, uh, some uh, uh, development uh, programs uh, uh, was uh, initiated during this period and uh, not the last one because we have now another program from uh, 2018 and uh, the objective is to rehabilitate uh, historical building to 2022. <clears throat> So, uh, of course, the global development objective were declined in the following components, development of the historic buildings, rehabilitation programs, improvement of accessibility and emergency circulation network inside, of course, uh, Medina, improvement of the Medina environment, exploration of the rehabilitation process to eradicate poverty, 
and institutional strengthening and capacity uh, building. We have some uh, uh, illustration to show you uh, now the, the situation. And of course, compare it to the before, for example, in this guide. Uh, here, uh, a good example, Ras uh, Sharatin Madrasa. Before and after, of course, rehabilitation and the restoration. Uh, some conclusion. Uh, there are, of course, some areas of success of the conservation program of FES uh, in terms of social participation, which is essential for the successful rehabilitation of the historic housing stock and uh, reconciling the objectives of urban conservation and the rehabilitation with the housing needs of the in, in, insolvent inhabitant is feasible through the process of consultation and social participation in the design and the implementation of the interventions of the historic housing stock, especially housing stock. But the tenure of land and buildings is a critical difficulty in the rehabilitation of historic cities. Municipalities should consider delegating urban rehabilitation operations to competent agency. And we can say uh, urban rehabilitation projects should be designed according to simple objective and design. And given complexities of intervening historic cities, the related interventions should not try and address all of the needs under a single operation, but should rather support a program or programmatic approach. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Now um, I'm going to present Elena Mamani. Elena is graduated uh, architecture engineering from the National Technical University of Athens in 2004 and worked for several years as specialist and director in the urban planning office of Eurocastra region. Deputy director program manager, cultural heritage without borders, Albania. And her engagement in the field of cultural heritage started back in 2008 with the first projects of cultural heritage without borders in Albania. She's mainly working with conservation projects, emergency interventions, and regional training programs. She has been training in disaster risk management for cultural heritage in courses organized by Ikram and Ritsumeikan University in Japan. And since then, she's managing together with her colleague the projects of cultural heritage without border Albania related to this topic. Uh, starting for, uh, from energy for from any emergency intervention in building at risk, uh, pilot, piloting new ideas on the protection of monuments from disaster and regional training with professional at the Balkans region. She's currently, she's currently engaged in the reconstruction and restoration process uh, of four national importance monuments that are damaged by the earthquake that hit Albania in November 2019. Uh, her presentation is Earthquake Disaster Response, Cultural Heritage Without Borders in Albania. Welcome, Elena, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcela. Um, uh, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Uh, I'd like to first uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, above all, thank you for uh, uh, inviting us uh, to present uh, one of our projects in this very important uh, uh, seminar. Uh, so today I will talk uh, about uh, a project of um, earthquake disaster response that we are uh, implementing uh, since last year uh, in Albania. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Cultural Heritage Without Borders. We are a foundation, an independent non-governmental organization 
dedicated to rescuing and preserving tangible and intangible cultural heritage affected by conflict, neglect, or uh, natural disasters. The organization started back in uh, 1995 uh, as a reaction to the disaster of disasters of uh, destruction of, of cultural heritage monuments uh, during the conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, we are active for more than 25 years now uh, in the Western Balkans. And uh, our pers perspective uh, broadened from uh, early post-conflict uh, reconstruction to mid-term social recovery and uh, long-term stability and uh, economical development. We are now actually three independent offices uh, in Albania, uh, Kosovo, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but we are part uh, of a big CGWB uh, family. We, our vision is that everyone has the right to enjoy, have access to, and participate in cultural heritage. Uh, our mission is that heritage is used as a right and as a resource. Cultural heritage is used to strengthen peace building and to promote economical development of the, of the societies. We work uh, with uh, civil society organizations, cultural and educational institutions, uh, international development agencies, private sector organizations and uh, governmental agencies. And we work very closely also with the members of the society, but we wouldn't be uh, able uh, to implement all our projects without the support of our uh, donors. So to give a little bit of uh, context of uh, Albania, it's a small country uh, positioned in the penins Balkan Peninsula, uh, and it is uh, uh, surrounded by uh, Greece, uh, North Macedonia, Kosovo, and uh, Montenegro. Uh, it is very rich in historical and uh, cultural heritage monuments, um, varying from uh, remains of uh, ancient civilizations, Byzantine and post-Byzantine churches, mosques, uh, old bridges, castles, and the vernacular architecture. Uh, we have uh, four World Heritage sites within, sites within our territory, with the last one, uh, the extension of uh, Albanian part of uh, Ohrid Lake, uh, and included as a natural and cultural uh, heritage, world heritage. Albania, it's vulnerable, it's a small country, but uh, it is vulnerable to a range of natural and human affected uh, disasters from earthquakes, floods, landslides, fires, and um, uh, another disaster which is uh, slow, uh, its effect is really slow, but uh, again, very important when it comes uh, to cultural heritage and it's the lack, lack of maintenance, abandonment or uh, illegal interventions. On uh, November 2019, Albania was hit by um, a, a huge earthquake uh, that caused significant, significant casualties and property damage. Uh, unfortunately, there were uh, loss of people's lives, uh, but there were also, um, a, 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 of a particular concern, was also the damages uh, to the cultural heritage properties. And there were 50, 53. Uh, monuments that were damaged, out of which 23 were classified as a very high risk. Uh, we, as a cultural heritage without borders, undertook uh, the restoration of four of these uh, monuments damaged by the earthquake, uh, and they are positioned in three different uh, cities in the central of Albania. We are working with um, uh, Tower C in uh, Durs, that are part of the uh, ancient walls uh, of, of Durs city, the castle of uh, Preza and the two buildings, the clock tower in Kruja and the Teke of Dolma, uh, again, in the, uh, within the castle of, uh, of Kruja. But uh, due to the limited time, I'm going to uh, talk only uh, for two of these uh, interventions in this presentation. Uh, this is a project uh, that is implemented and designed and implemented by CHWB Albania with the financial support of uh, Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation, Prince Klaus Fund and uh, Sweden. And we are working in collaboration with World Monument Fund, National Institute of Culture Heritage, and Ministry of Culture. The project is divided in uh, several phases, and we have started from preparation and implementation of uh, emergency stabilizations to stabilize and to secure the buildings and to secure also the people who are working uh, in the site. And then uh, we, pre we are preparing, we pre have prepared some of, uh, and we are now preparing conservation approaches uh, for full restoration and rehabilitation of the buildings. 
uh, we are going to implement the works and also the project includes interpretation, education and uh, a revitaliz proposal for revitalization of these uh, buildings. Uh, the first building is um, uh, the Tower C of uh, Duras, and uh, it is a building uh, that um, the first um, phase starts from the Byzantine period, and it has uh, different uh, phases because the building was also uh, destroyed for, by another uh, big earthquake in uh, 13th century. Uh, but there is also a later phase from the Ottoman period. Uh, you can see here the photo. Uh, after the, the earthquake and uh, how these big pieces of wall have been spread uh, uh, out uh, uh, in the terrain. We started immediately after the earthquake with the documentation and preparation of this uh, uh, emergency stabilization. And when we have uh, the project ready and all the uh, approvals by uh, uh, the institutions, uh, then the pandemic strikes. So we were... Um, forced to uh, to a lockdown for two or three months we could months we couldn't really start the works but as soon as the situation became a little bit uh, better we immediately started with uh, implementing the emergency propping uh, first by moving actually all the big uh, fragments uh, and creating uh, cleaning the the, the, the the site in order to be able to do a better documentation and the, the necessary analysis. We have been documenting uh, all the pieces of the, of the wall. Uh, and you can see here, uh, trying also to identify where this build, these pieces were standing in the wall and to see if we, it will be possible then to, to put them back uh, in their place. We did the necessary geological studies, uh, analysis of the, of the materials and the different other surveys. And uh, we finally, in uh, July last year, we uh, we were able to to implement or still to put this first uh, metal structure that will uh, stabilize uh, temporarily the, the the wall and uh, will create also a, a safe environment for the people who are working around. Uh, we continue then with uh, different uh, studies and analysis from uh, trying to find old pictures and understand what was the reason of collapse and then doing even uh, seismic analysis. And uh, this is um, a simulation of, uh, of collapse. And uh, we have prepared and the final the conservation proposal. And uh, our aim is to try to put back uh, all the pieces of the wall back in their place and fill the, the, the pieces that are completely destroyed and create also uh, a secure tying of, of the wall in order to secure it uh, for uh, further uh, earthquakes in the future. Um, we have just started the implementation of the works with uh, cleaning the interior. And um, uh, it, it's also a project that um, we, we always say the restoration project never it's finalized when the works are finalized. So by doing, doing uh, test pits, we also reconsider uh, our approach and we make proper decisions for the reinforcement of the existing structure. Uh, the second building is the clock tower of Kruja. Uh, this is also a um, building that the early phases were from the 11th and 12th century. It is also thought that uh, this, this building has been destroyed by another earthquake and we can um, uh, understand that there is a, a phase of uh, rebuilding of the structure. And then in the, the 17th century, it was turned into a clock tower. Uh, the building was uh, uh, damaged uh, very much by the earthquake uh, and um, also the causes were different because of uh, the different interventions and the uh, uh, missing of the uh, wooden ties that were uh, reinforcing the, the building, but also some interventions with, uh, um, with, uh, with the concrete uh, that uh, were done in the 70s that created some stress uh, to the underneath uh, structure. Uh, here, actually, there is a huge problem also for the, with the stabilization of the rock underneath. So uh, at this phase, uh, we have planned uh, emergency uh, stabilization with uh, this um, uh, iron ties of the building until the stabilization of the, of the under uh, rock is done. And then we will, uh, in the same time, prepare the conservation project and uh, uh, later on, uh, finalize also the full uh, restoration of the building. Um, and we have uh, now started the works of uh, this first tying and stabilization of the structure 
and we are in this uh, phase of the moment. Here is also some photos from the interior and how the structure is uh, is destroyed. So these are uh, only two of the buildings we are working with and we are under implementation. So I hope we will have other opportunities to, it, it's a two years long uh, project and uh, I hope we'll have other opportunities uh, to share with you the final result of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. Very interesting project and yes, we want to see the, the results of the of the that interventions. Thank you. Uh, now is the turn of Steve Kelly. Stephen Kelly, he's an architect, an engineer who has devoted these two skills to the preservation of real cultural heritage. With 35 ex years of experience, his project range from small to immersed, simple to sophisticated, and cover a wide range of building materials and system. His award-winning projects are located through the U United States of America and Asia, Europe, Africa, and, and the Caribbean. He has managed state-of-the-art multidisciplinary teams that were designed to meet the demand of each project. He has served to the board of director of both the United States Committee of ECOMOS and the Association for, for Preservation Technology. His part he, he is past chair of the American Society for, St for Testing and Material on Building Preservation and Rehabilitation Technologies. He is past president in the International Scientific Committee of the Analyze and Restoration of Structures of Architectural Heritage, and he is UNESCO Tangible Heritage Expert. He's going to present us the ID, uh, the 2010 earthquake, and the measure to conserve the Citadel World Heritage Site. Welcome, Steve, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marcella. Um, I, I assume everybody can see my screen. <clears throat> yes, we can see. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, I'm gratified to be, uh, be with you all uh, today, and I thank the organizers for pulling this together. I've got a lot of it, a lot to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I've been working in Haiti since 2010. I've been there about um, 17, 18 times, uh, working in uh, different parts of the of the country. Um, this is the this is the Caribbean Sea, South America. Here's Florida, part of the United States, and um, this is the island of Hispaniola, and this is where Haiti is located. It's a very large, uh, very large island with two nations on it. Um, there are there are cruise ships that go all through the Caribbean um, uh, in pre-pandemic times, and that will be back again. So there's a lot of there's a lot of tourism. It stops at about all of these islands, but they don't stop in Haiti. Normally, they don't stop in Haiti. Haiti has a really interesting history. These are the first people of Haiti, the Tainos. The second people of um, Haiti were the colonizers. First, the Spanish who came and enslaved the first people who turned out to not be very good um, uh, slaves. And they were killed off. And there are none of these, uh, there are none of these uh, descendants left in Haiti, mostly in the Dominican Republic. You have Tainos, but not in Haiti. And so, uh, and so Africans were brought over um, to run the, uh, the plantation society. The interesting thing that happened in Haiti, however, is that they had a successful slave rebellion and revolution, which lasted from 1704. And so they became a free um, island nation very early with a, with a black um, um, African population. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time about the history, but uh, but Toussaint Louverture was the was the uh, was the hero of the revolution. Um, uh, very early on, the 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 country was split into two um, areas. There was a republic, and there was a state in the north. Henri Christophe, who is going to be the main person in our narrative of this, uh, of this tale. Here's, an, here's a picture of the island of Hispaniola. Uh, Columbus first landed here in December of 1492. He named the island Hispaniola, which means Little Spain. 
Um, I'm going to briefly talk about Port-au-Prince down here in Capation, where the, where the Citadel World Heritage Site is located. There was an earthquake in January of 2010, which happened in this area very close to Port-au-Prince. This is when I first went to Port-au-Prince. This is what it looked like when we first got there. Um, it's, it is recovering now, but at the time it was, it was, it was in complete pandemonium. We were working on the gingerbread houses, and this was a project that we were doing with ECOMOS, with World Monuments Fund, and with the Association for Preservation Technology. We looked at about 200 of these gingerbread houses. Um, some of them we were able to restore. This is just an example of one of those projects. This is the Maison du Four. When, as we first saw it, almost completely destroyed, we were able to restore it, put it in a seismic rehabilitation system, and now it is the center of um, of the arts in Port-au-Prince. And so they have uh, they have uh, art exhibits on the inside, and they have musical performance on the outside, and those are continuing through COVID. So now we're going to go to the north northern part of Haiti. Um, this is the Palais Saint Souci, which was constructed by uh, by uh, Emperor Henri Christophe in 1811 to 1813, and it was destroyed by an earthquake in 1842. He had already uh, he had already passed away, and then it was looted. And one of the reasons it was looted is, is he was not a very popular emperor. The, uh, the country had been freed of, it, um, of its slavery. Um, however, he indentured um, people into building nine palaces and 15 forts. And he did it during his short tenure as emperor. So this is, this is, this is the way it exists today. It has been this way since 1842. It's amazing that it's holding together the way it is. It's a fairly large um, a plot of land. This is the Palais. Um, I'm not going to talk about everything here. I'm going to focus on the Chapelle Royale, which is down here. Um, this is a this is the only view that we have of the Palais Saint Souci uh, prior to its destruction. It was a it was a naive painting by Numa de Roche, uh, circa 1818. He was about 17 years old when he painted this. Uh, this picture, but we get an idea of the palace, um, the grounds, and here is the chapelle, which I'm going to discuss. Some other images of, uh, of um, and here's the chapel here, and the, um, and, and the ruins, the extensive ruins. <clears throat> okay, the Chapel Royale, also known as the Chapel de Milo. This is the village of Milo. If you ever visit this World Heritage Center, come into town, you will come into Milo, and then you will go uphill, and you'll get to the uh, you'll get to the, the Palais Saint Souci. Um, this is a larger uh, church than it looks like. Here's another image of it, um, and a, a, a photograph from the interior. These are all photographs that I took in 2016, 2017. This is what the chapel looked like pre 1930. You can see that the dome had collapsed. It was made out of wood and it had collapsed, possibly it burned, and it was reconstructed in 1930. And again, it's hard to get an idea of how large this, um, this, uh, this structure really is because it's a very large structure. And unfortunately, this is the way it looked on the morning after 17 April 2020 when it burned down again. And those of us who worked on this uh, on this site, we were heartbroken to see that this had occurred. So this was the one structure at the Palais Saint Souci that was actually being used as a um, as a as a church it, um, uh, for the village. But let's go up the side of the mountain, um, overlooking the Palais Saint Souci, and also overlook. Uh, Capation is the Citadel La Ferrière, which also was constructed in 1811-1813, and it was uh, it was damaged by the earthquake in 1842, and then it was looted. Fortunately, most inside the fort were so heavy that they couldn't be they couldn't be taken away, and they're still there today. 
this is an image of of the uh, of the uh, of the fortress. I'm going to focus my discussion on the bat battery quad David, which is here. This is the largest and most authentic fortress in the Caribbean. It is um, it is amazing, and it's in uh, it's in amazingly good shape. Here you can see the, the, they still have the cannonballs in place. An interesting aspect of this fortress is it's sitting on top of a mountain and the mountain is a limestone outcropping and you can see a little bit of the outcropping here. Um, and so it is, it is firmly planted on bedrock and I firmly believe that this is one of the reasons why it's still standing is because it's got such wonderful foundations. Um, and a view from the inside, you can see there the cannons are still in place. This was the this was the armory that had a um, had a large explosion, which is part of the history. And I don't have time to talk about it, but you can see it standing standing in place, even though it had this huge explosion on the inside. And some images of the in and around the uh, around the fortress. So this is a this is a, anybody who's interested in fortresses, this would be a dream trip to take. Difficult to get to, however. Um, and this is the Battery Quad David. It's got some large cracks in it. Um, everybody talks about these being fairly new. However, um, some of us know Gustavo Arauz, who was, as a young man was actually, um, actually, uh, he was actually stationed by the um, organization of the OAS um, in, in Capation, and he remembers these cracks. And indeed, I think that many of these cracks probably um, are from the 1842 of earthquake, which damaged just the Battery Quad David. And here you can see some images of the interior of the Battery Quad David, and you can see some of the damage, which is, which is significant. One of the things that we did, and by the way, I, uh, we were retained by UNESCO as the heritage architect, and we came up with a conservation management plan for the entire park. And I, I'll talk about that in question and answers if anybody has any questions. But I, right now, I just want to tell the story of the extreme challenges that we have with this project. So we came up with an, an emergency stabilization for the Battery Quad David, which was shoring and some horizontal metal ties to hold everything together. These are the archives of the, of, the, uh, of the National Park and World Heritage Site in Capation. They're in, a, they're in a very poor state. One of the boxes, I opened it up and there was a photograph uh, that was taken off the wall of uh, Papa Doc du Bellier, which kind of dates the last time that anybody actually used this archive was was um, at least 30 years ago. And so this is in a, this is in a fairly uh, poor state. Um, this, I put this photograph in because the last time I was, I, was at the, um, I was at the fortress, there are three ways to get to the fortress. You can walk, hike up the mountain, you can go by horseback or you can go by all-terrain vehicle. And I would always go by horseback. And the gentleman on the right with a very pained expression on his face is Amidus, who I would always rent my horses from Amidus. And um, this was the day after I was thrown from my horse. Actually, I wasn't thrown from the horse. The, the equipment, the horse's equipment was so bad that the saddle just collapsed and dumped me off onto the road. And they patched me up and I came back the next day. I got back on my horse. But uh, Mamie Luce was, uh, he was, he was pretty shaken by the whole thing, more so than me. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is a national park. And on the back side, I told you on the front side, you go through the village of Milo. But on the back side is the village of Don Don. And Don Don is a village that was founded by the Maron. And the Maron were a, uh, were a, were a people, were enslaved people who fled the plantation and went up into the mountains and lived a, uh, a sole existence of subsistence farming. And they are, their descendants are still there. They're a fiercely independent people. And of course, this is one of the voodoo caves that you can visit if you ever go to Dondon because um, the voodoo culture is still alive in some parts of, of Haiti. 
and uh, closing. Uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, it, one of the problems we have there here is uh, the encroachment of settlements um, within the national park. There are people who live there, and of course, it's okay for people to live in a World Heritage Site. But um, uh, uh, for instance, this woman, her sh her shanty, this is right below the chapel to Milo. And if we're going to do any work on the chapel, then um, then actually she's going to have to move. People drying their clothes, uh, the watering hole, the local watering hole, which is right below the uh, the Palais Saint Souci. It's a uh, charming and very and, and shows the extreme poverty in Haiti. Um, Haiti has um, has wonderful people, very artistic. Um, they have an interesting cuisine. I can't say it's a wonderful cuisine, but it's certainly very interesting, and I've gotten very used to it. Um, working in uh, working in Haiti, I've always had to work with um, the local architects and engineers who need training because the capacity they 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 are in dire need of capacity building, not only of professional but of um, of skilled labor. So, in conclusion. Um, Haiti has a deep and varied and interesting culture in art, in music, but it's very hard to experience because though there is a large tourism industry in the Caribbean, people don't go to Haiti and the reason is because of the extreme poverty and, and, and to be honest, many people are, would be afraid to go there and it's not an easy country to travel in. There were significant historical events that occurred here, and the um, the citadel and this national park. And so it's extremely important to the people of Haiti. It's got a high degree of authenticity. However, the um, there are significant vulnerabilities to uh, to this World Heritage Site, which has to do with earthquakes and hair and hurricanes, but really the most significant vulnerability are the economic challenges. You've seen the poorly kept archives. Um, I've talked about the low capacity in professional and skilled labor. There's a very poor infrastructure to and through the site. So if you wanted to visit this site, it would be difficult for you to get there. You could and you can, but it's difficult to get to. And of course, I showed that photograph of me being thrown off of a horse because there are dangers just actually going to the site. There is encroaching uh, settlements. Uh, the heritage is not well safeguarded, which is um, which is represented by the fact that the Chapel de Milo it burned down um, 13 months ago, and of course, the pandemic has closed. The the the, um, the island down. I'm still in touch with my uh, my colleagues in um, in Haiti, but the pandemic is just one other of a multitude of challenges that are faced by Haiti. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for you, this interesting presentation, and also for share with us your personal experience on the island. And now uh, our last presentation um, is Claudia Gonzalez. Uh, Claudia Gonzalez is an architect from the Catholic University in Santiago de Chile, master in science in the in environment sci science and society uh, for the University College uh, in London. She also she holds a postgraduate degree in sustainable development in the University of London, 2011. She's member of Ecomos Chile and the College uh, Architect of Chile. She's president of the Corporation of Risk and Disaster Manage Management Grid Chile and professor at the University Federico Santa Maria. She has participated in different projects related to natural disaster and conservation of cultural heritage. And also she coordinated studies related to the nomination of the Capagnan part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Claudia is going to present to us the fragility of the Inca road system, the Capatnian, in Chile. Welcome, Claudia. You have the floor. Thank you, Marcela. And thank all the organizers for this interesting seminar. I will, could you see the screen? 
the presentation? Yes, Claudia, yes. Well, I will present the case of Capagnani in Chile. Um, the Capagnan or Andean road system is a world heritage site with segment located in six countries, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. It is in Chile, it is composed by a series of fragments of roads and archeological sites related to the presence of the Inca in the north of the country. Many of the roads have uh, a pre-origin, uh, a pre-Inca origin, and they were later used by local communities up to the 20th century. Some of them were subsequently transformed into modern roads. Unlike we observed in Peru, the Capagnan in Chile is a little world, little known heritage uh, here in the country. And uh, as you can see in the images, uh, the road has a wide diversity of typologies according to the geography it crosses, slopes and topographic conditions, as well as oil types. The width varies from 40 centimeters to more than six meters. Here in the third image, you can see that uh, there is a modern road that uh, has the, the, the previous uh, track of the Capagnan and in the middle of the, the image, you can see the remaining of the uh, Inca trail. The geographies have a long history of human occupations from uh, 6,000 before present approximately, and at present several indigenous communities inhabit these territories. The archeological sites, however, were abandoned after the Spanish uh, conquers, and also there were also processes of abandonment before that due to climate uh, reasons. Today, some of the problems we have is that uh, there are uh, continuous rural to urban migration and the change of land use patterns that make also this, uh, this heritage very vulnerable. The building techniques uh, involve the use of local materials, mainly stones, and in some cases uh, that are built with adobe, uh, rounded uh, river stones, and also edge volcanic rocks were employed for the uh, construction of the structures. For the constructions of the delimitation of the roads, they were uh, used the, ma the materials located in the surroundings and also for the construction of the associated structures, like this kind of uh, uh, little structures that uh, allow to um, indicate some directions of the road uh, in the middle of the desert. The construction technique expresses the wisdom of taking advantage of local resources and adaptability to the particular environment. The preservation of the road in spite of its lack of use and maintenance was proof of, its, of that wisdom and also the efficiency of the techniques employed. However, uh, more than a century later the, from the last use the or most of the roads had, uh, made, uh, uh, made the roads very vulnerable to climatic conditions. The techniques used to save slopes require a great knowledge of materials and construction system, but they are very fragile to the effects of natural agents, particularly rainfall and landslide in areas of high slope. Among the main hazards are earthquake, wind erosion, landslide, flash floods, and also activities such as mining, or even renewal, renewable energy projects, wind and solar due to the fragility of the landscape. Prepared uh, during, the, uh, um, during the period of the nomination for the Capagnan to the World Heritage List, the alteration of the sites were uh, studied and also the geological condition at the regional level and at the local level. 
at the local at the local level they were studied by the each of the segments of the roads and also the places where the uh, archaeological sites are located identifying the main natural hazards uh, but also for the conservation plans all the alterations of the site and the road and the effects on the values of the Kambanjan were studied there were also uh, as you can see well in the in the first uh, table, uh, each of the alterations were studied and how they affect each of the uh, values for each segment of the road and each site. And also they were prioritized in order to propose conservation actions according to the frequency and severity. Here are for a, a summary of the main hazards uh, and the natural hazard and main induced hazard for one of the segments of the Inca Trail, uh, which is the, um, the Kupo Topain segment. And uh, in the low part of the, the, the screen, you can see that, uh, for example, in the cases of Catarpe, most natural hazards are earthquake, landslides, heavy rain events, the river in floods, debris flow from the river course and weathering for, uh, because of the difference between the, the temperature uh, between the day and night. Uh, among the main human induced hazards, you can see that uh, the uncontrolled tourism activities in the sites, looting of cemetery remainings and other archaeological objects, the changes in the riverbed uh, for building hotels, and also water of the river controlled and channeled to irrigate the cultural land. The main vulnerability and exposure of those sites are the structural width integrity that is common for all of the sites in the Capagnan. The soil and slope conditions of site location make it highly exposed to landslide. There is no uh, management body in action yet, uh, 10 years after the management plan was finished. Uh, there is lack of science and information. There is disagreement about how to manage set the site, uh, the tourism in the site between the local indigenous communities and the state part. And the people uh, of Catarpe do not live there, there. And that is also a common problem to all of these segments and uh, for the roads and site because normally the, the people doesn't live in the traditional towns but live now in the city. Uh, so the places are more abandoned than before. And the possible impacts to the main attributes are the weakness or loss of structures due to earthquake, water erosion, weathering and landslide, the erosion of damage on trails due to lack of maintenance, the loss of archeological values due to looting, um, the injuries, possible injuries to visitors due to earthquake, like to landslide or other hazards uh, that may active. Uh, the visitors or local people could be trapped or injured uh, because of the flash floods or the debris flow in the riverbed. And the economic activities of the local populations could be affected too. Here is a summary, uh, a graphic summary about uh, the natural hazards and how they interact with uh, the different kinds of types of vulnerabilities. Uh, the physical vulnerability related to the materials and the state of the structures, the environmental vulnerabilities due to climate change, institutional vulnerabilities because there is no management, uh, active and effective management of the site yet, uh, the loss of historic or archaeological values, uh, and the, the possible uh, effects on the cultural and economic uh, of the, local, of the local communities. Some factors exacerbating vulnerability of the Capagnan are the changes of land, of land use patterns and also the economic activities of the local population because they uh, now prefer live in the city or their work on mining or their work on services and they have abandoned the traditional towns. There are mining and other productive activities uh, such uh, this, for example, these uh, projects of renewable energy, uh, the geological hazards, and most of all, more recently, we have seen a lot of uh, effects of the climate change. 
There is also a bureaucracy problem uh, for making projects of conservation and preservation in the site uh, because of lack of management and lack of resources. So there, we have some long lasting landscape, but there are a very high risk. Uh, and we will see some examples now about how these risks have evolved in the time. Uh, when we studied the, the site and the risk present in each of the segments and the sites, we studied also previous events. For example, for uh, the sector named uh, Finca Chañaral, we identified some effects from the uh, a landslide occurring in, 2000, in uh, 1972. We have also observed a, a rock land, a rock falls uh, in the, into the site and also erosion in the riverbed for previous uh, landslide events. Uh, in the 2015 event, uh, this is an, uh, a massive event that, that uh, affected the Atacama region uh, and also affected the entire Rio Salado and Copiapó river basin, affecting localities in the region. For example, Diego de Almagro, which is the capital of the municipality of uh, Diego de Almagro, where Finca Chañaral here in the Red Circle is located. Uh, and all the, the drainage uh, uh, on the basin of the Rio Salado and Rio Copiapó were affected by landslide uh, that started in the hike part of the basin. And then uh, uh, re uh, very quickly moved into the slow uh, parts of the basin until it finished in, Chana in Chañaral at the coast. Uh, affecting a lot of places, uh, also Diego Almagro, Copiapó, the, the capital of the region of Atacama and other uh, cities like Chañaral. In that occasion, uh, the event occurred on the 23 or 25 March in 2015, it caused damages about uh, $1.5 billion. It affected three regions uh, of the country and almost 200,000 200, people. Uh, and the Finca Chañaral, which is one of the sites uh, recognized by the Capagnan, was partially destroyed. Uh, as you can see, the, the event was so massive that uh, some of the river basin uh, and the riverbed uh, has uh, like two or three meters of uh, er eroded. And one of the uh, part, uh, attributes of the site, the called um, House of Filippi was destroyed here in the, in the lower left image, you can see the the structure before the event and then after the event. Uh, we also have so, uh, seen the change of on the patterns of precipitation and the, 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 and the, the period in which they are concentrated. There is normally summer rains uh, each uh, year related to the altiplanic winter that we call but uh, during the last years, we have observed a uh, changing of patterns and a lot of more uh, extreme events. These images, for example, are from 2019 event and there are in the region of Arican Parinacota. This is uh, what, uh, the Northern part of the Capagnan in Chile and there are landslides here affecting some parts of the road and also the, there is erosion and the, the water uh, run through the, the trail. So uh, they have been uh, eroded very quickly. Uh, there is also uh, this case if the Tambo Kamar, uh, which was almost completely destroyed during the February 2019 event because it was a very unusual extreme event related to summer rains. Uh, in that event in particular, six people died, not here in, the, the, in this site, but in the region. And there caused uh, a lot of economic disruption uh, related to tourism, mining, agriculture, and so on. So as you can see, we have um, 
we still do not have in place a management uh, body for each of the segments. There is the complexity that all of the segments are uh, related to different uh, communities and also there are different administrative uh, regions. So, uh, and we still have a very centralized uh, administrative system of uh, cultural heritage in Chile. So we have a lot of challenges and there is a call for urgent action uh, uh, regarding Capagnan conservation because it's a very fragile site and the, some of the challenges we recognize are the priorities of local communities. They change uh, quickly uh, after the last event and also because of the pandemic. There are a lack of economic resources to preservation and protection of cultural heritage in Chile and in particular to this site because there is a very complex uh, site. Uh, the, the state involvement and the priority set to this site is still very low uh, and the lack of effective managing is one of the uh, most important challenges and uh, as time passed we lost of local knowledge and lo lost of local techniques that were used to build the, the sites in the first place. So we need to start working very quickly if we don't want to lose uh, more of the Capacnian site, which is more vulnerable now to the climate, uh, due to the climate change and other hazards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia, for the interesting presentation and to highlight the impact of climate change, particularly here in, in Capacnan roads in Capacnan. Uh, now we have time for some discussion uh, from, uh, for some question. It was really interesting to see uh, the different cases uh, from different parts of the world and also different period from archaeological sites to uh, aside from the 20th century. And I really appreciate that. And uh, all of you uh, have, I, I want to start asking a question to all the panel, the panelists and all of you mention, have mentioned the importance of the community as a key actor in risk management in, in general, in, in the different a part of, of the process. And in some cases, uh, like the case of that Peter or Khalid presented, uh, are public buildings, the case of Stephen or, or, or Elena, for example, are the public space is, is also important as, as uh, the potential risk that we can find there or what happened with the, 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 the owners, the case that uh, uh, Professor Okubo present to us, and, and Claudia, you show a very critical situation with uh, where the community is not present, uh, and it is supposed also a, a big challenge. And my question is about how do, how do you see the, the interaction, how, how in the particular cases or your particular uh, cultural situation, uh, how do you see the connection to the community? How can we improve that? Uh, uh, how uh, happened that today or not? Uh, please, can you please tell us uh, about that? Um, I want to start with Peter, please. Um, well, very good, good question. Um, <laughs> The, one of the things that the Opera House has continually to battle against is the concept that it is an elitist place, that uh, the kinds of performances that it puts on are, uh, <clears throat> well, certainly for the rich um, and, and, um, uh, and, and for the, you know, the sort of upper end of the culture spectrum. Now, they have actually worked quite hard to broaden the range of uh, performances and activities in the Opera House so that uh, everybody feels a part of it. The interesting thing is that most people don't think of it as a heritage place, but simply a 
simply a place uh, to visit um, and go to. And <clears throat> the, the community really did come out in force when there was a proposal to uh, put a, a, um, a projected advertisement for a horse race onto the sails of the Opera House. Um, <clears throat> now, there's, there's, we have an annual festival in Sydney every year called uh, Vivid, which is light shows all over the place, and there's wonderful sort of artistic projections on the sails of the Opera House. Um, but this proposal to, to project uh, a, you know, basically an advertisement for a horse race onto the shells really did bring the community out in support of um, not doing that, you know, in other words, not commercialising the place. Um, and to, to many of us in the heritage community, that was quite a surprise. But, you know, I, I think there is a deep connection, but it's not necessarily um, always, uh, always on show, uh, but it, it can be on show when events like this uh, uh, bring it out. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Khalid, what can you tell uh, us about the situation in Morocco? Yes, yes. With... Uh, regarding the, the safeguarding of uh, Medina of uh, Fez, we can say that uh, uh, the overall rehabilitation strategy could not be launched without seeking adequate tools in terms of uh, institution, uh, finance, and uh, techniques. For, of course, the implementation of, uh, of the, the rehabilitation program. And uh, in my uh, conclusions, I... Uh, Evoke uh, the agency for for implementing, of course, uh, the, the this program. We maybe we we didn't mention that in this uh, safeguarding uh, program, there is uh, one uh, actor very. Uh, involved uh, in, uh, in this process. It's uh, ADER, we call it ADER FES, the Agency for the Dedensification and Rehabilitation of FES Medina. Of course, uh, the power of this uh, agency because it's directly under the, uh, the Ministry of, uh, of uh, the Interior. So it's, it's, it's a poor uh, actor and uh, of course uh, he is the, the main, uh, we can say, uh, interlocutor, the main uh, significant actor uh, who, and le leader, leader in, the, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, program of rehabilitation. And uh, it, this agency uh, placed uh, stakeholder participation and uh, uh, animation at the core of uh, its implementation strategy, including, as I said, social uh, animation and social participation in housing rehabilitation uh, and uh, it has set the program of emergency in uh, intervention on historic monuments and the buildings, and and uh, of course housing unit uh, treating collapse. This is very important, uh, 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 of course, uh, component of this uh, of this intervention. Anyway. I, I would like just to to, to focus on uh, on uh, this kind of uh, 
the involvement of the inhabitant and the population in this uh, safeguarding process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleague. Uh, Elena, please. Yes, um, actually, we all uh, understand the importance, uh, the key role of the community in all our actions uh, regarding the preservation of cultural heritage. And we have been actually trying uh, different ways of uh, in including uh, the, the, the different stakeholder groups uh, in all processes uh, of uh, restoration. Uh, actually, more uh, to be more precise, for this specific project, we are thinking different uh, ways of um, uh, having meetings and activities with the community. We are uh, now planning, especially in uh, Tower C in Duras, we are going to, to build, a, we call it a restoration corner, uh, and we are planning to have their uh, different activities with different groups of the community um, throughout the whole process of restoration. So informing uh, the community is really in important and uh, keeping them updated on what is going on with their cultural heritage. Uh, we have started also um, at, at sessions of uh, um, presentations uh, regarding the interventions we are doing with the uh, students from uh, different universities uh, in, here in Albania. Uh, and because it is a pandemic now, we are doing this online. Uh, we have prepared also some, uh, like this, for example. Um, yes, I don't know if you can, no, you cannot see this. Uh, it's like uh, for, for kids, we have prepared this uh, tool for them to play to show how you can save uh, a, a cultural heritage building that is at risk. Uh, and they cut, you know, and how you can tie this building. So these are different ways uh, we are um, trying, different ways to, to include and to inform uh, different uh, stakeholder groups and uh, the community about our work and about to make them more aware about the preservation of cultural heritage. Thank you, Elena. Very interesting. The using of this kind of tools, very useful also, and very easy to, to get uh, to... To, to, go, to address the information to the community. Uh, please, uh, Takeyuki, I, for, I forgot to... to Thank you, to <laughs> uh, It's a very important question. So, so I believe that so, uh, a community is a most important uh, stakeholder. So in the scene of the serious disasters like earthquake, so it can be a main actor for uh, disaster mitigation activities in the site. And uh, uh, so as that, I would like to ask the local people to uh, utilize uh, uh, firefighting equipment in daily basis. And uh, but uh, because of the, this COVID-19 pandemic, so it is very, uh, in case of a tourist site, it is uh, very serious uh, conditions because uh, uh, even in, in daytimes, uh, sometimes uh, most of the uh, shops and the restaurants are closed. So as that uh, there are no person who can uh, act against uh, emergency situations in this uh, in this case. And so as that uh, we should think about uh, how to uh, keep the activities and uh, keep the uh, conditions uh, against the emergency situation, even in case of the COVID-19 situations. So it's our challenges also. Thank you very much for your uh, comment. Thank you. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, a bit challenger. Uh, uh, Steve, what can you tell us from your experience in Haiti, please? Well, I can tell you that um, at the World Heritage Site, which has which has um, three sites within it, not not the two that I presented, but there are three. Um, there would be no site without the without the local population that lives there. Um, they make their livelihood as if you hike up the mountain, there will be people selling you trinkets and playing music. Um, everybody is looking to, um, to benefit from some type of economy. Um, with most World Heritage Sites, we worry about the fact that there are too many tourists, but um, at, the, uh, at this particular World Site, they really, they don't have enough, um, they don't have enough tourism because it's, difficult to get to. 
So um, it's important. Um, and uh, I think that's that's about that's, I think that's about all I have to say about that. Um, they 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 do need um, uh, they do need they do need help. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. And Claudia, can, please. Uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Um, I think there is a big, big challenge in how to get involved the community in the case of Capacnan. Uh, because for example, when the process of nomination of the site took place, it took like 10 years, the whole process. So there were a long uh, involvement process of the community of each regional site for during those years. But after the nomination process, uh, there were no actions effectively on the site. So the, the connection with the people almost lost, almost completely lost. So uh, it is very important to regain the, the, the confidence of the people, they regain the, the trust of the people because there are a lot of unfulfilled promises regarding the conservation of the site, the management uh, of the site, the, the, the possible tourist uh, use of the of some of the sites and, or, and the trails. So it, I think that they should be start together tar and start again to build that uh, trust uh, with the communities. And also because of, uh, now the priorities of the communities have changed. They have also they, they have now a very different uh, priorities regarding the the the, the restoration or rebuilding of the the economic activities due to the pandemic. All of the tourism in the north of the country was uh, stopped. Uh, there were a lot of elderly people that they have. Uh, being retired, uh, some of them dying soon, some of the local uh, knowledge have been uh, losing in the last years. And uh, probably, probably the children uh, would be a, a good target to get involved uh, for, for the next generation to uh, uh, make actions directly on the sites. Thank you very much, Claudia. Yes, you point out very important that is very important to educate the young people and also the situation that you, you tell and also Steve related with uh, what happened after COVID. At the moment, the, priori the priorities are probably others. I have here a question uh, from Laura Piccioli is for, uh, is for who wants to answer, it's very interesting. It's, uh, uh, I'm going to read. Uh, transmitting how important it is to respect local materials in conservation repair is basic in the community as well, but with the climate change, conservation work also needs to be adapted to the new situa situation. What criteria can we use to choose and decide how on the best intervention without giving up this, its it, identity? But uh, sorry, but before I want to give the, the, the floor to Steve. Yes, Steve. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, in in Haiti, because of the because of a series of fires in Port-au-Prince, they uh, um, they sort of abandoned their uh, their local building techniques and went to this happened in 1925 and was codified. And in fact, a lot of the work that we were doing in Port-au-Prince, I was working with the uh, with the, the, a Belgian group, the Institut de Patrimoine Wallon, and they came in and they were teaching local craftspeople how to use lime mortars. And so we were trying to we we're trying to recreate some of the unreinforced masonry buildings. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of faith had been lost in unreinforced masonry buildings. Prince. And people were almost exclusively building things in concrete. And the problem with concrete is that if it's not properly designed, it can be just as dangerous as unreinforced masonry in an earthquake. So that was something that was very important to us. Another, another interesting aspect of Haiti, when we talk about global climate change, 
a lot of global climate change is poor land management. And in Haiti, when Columbus landed in Haiti in 1492, and for several hundred years, it was a forested mountainous mm -hmm. country. And the forests were pine, old growth, mahogany, oaks, all kinds of exotic um, mm. uh, woods, which were completely harvested. And that, and that, that was sent to um, Europe and to North and South America. And so the country now is completely denuded. And if you drive through the countryside, and I did this one day when we went to Jacmel, we were going over the mountains and it was raining. And you could see the erosion was just washing everything into the rivers and down to the sea. And that is because there are no forests left. And so these are really large problems that we face with global climate change simply because we have we have significantly changed the landscape. And also because of our, our post-industrial society, we have, um, we have lost traditional building techniques. And one of the things that we're trying to do in Haiti is we're trying to regain some of those lost techniques. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I remember also that discussion about how to reconstruct the um, um, the cathedral of Notre Dame because of the needed of uh, wood and that's supposed a problem because of, of the deforestation. It is a it is a very interesting question. I don't know uh, who want to to complement the the answer. Marcela? Si, please Claudia. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, regarding the, the climate change, uh, I think that it is very important in the case of Capagnan, the lack of maintenance. Uh, and for example, uh, during the time the roads were used by the local people, they uh, used to uh, um, do some annual maintenance of the roads. And when the new roads came and the vehicles and other kinds of um, modes of transport uh, became uh, prevalent, they stopped using the trails and they stopped maintaining them. Uh, so the, the trails uh, became the new channels of water when the summer rains came. Um, the same happened with ruins, of course. Uh, so the first challenge is how to uh, preserve the, the ruins and the structures uh, doing some uh, or promoting some kind of regular maintenance of the structures. Uh, and then there is a, a, another challenge uh, from the use of uh, local materials or a, a other kind of materials or other kind of techniques. But I think that in the case on, in this case in particular, the lack of maintenance is one of the critical uh, things uh, to, to address. Yes, it is. Thank you very much, Claudia. Well, I think uh, that we are on time, Karen. Uh, if some of you want to, to point out something else. Uh, thank you. Thank and, you, Marcella. Uh, very briefly, I want once again to uh, say thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation and uh, congratulations for the great presentation and great work that you are doing in your country. And I hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Marcela. And as you said, uh, thank you to the speakers of this session, Professor Takeyo Kyokubo, Peter Phillips, Khalid El Haruni, Elena Mamani, Stephen Kelly, and Claudia Gonzalez. They presented interesting cases uh, that expose the vulner vulnerability and the consequence of the loss of cultural heritage. Uh, in this scenario, it is essential to install and strengthen capacities for disaster risk management among all the stakeholders in order to reduce vulnerability to potential threats. I would like to invite you to the session nine, 
culture, uh, culture, heritage, and resilience, local creative responses to natural disasters, COVID-19, and climate, climate change. It is tomorrow, and it will be live streamed on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye.